Thank you, Northview. It is, it is great to be here with you. Pastor CJ and Kristen are, are great, dear friends. They're also incredible leaders, and uh, you're blessed to have them as, as your pastors here, and they're, we're blessed to have them as friends, so it's been great to reunite with them. I, I haven't been to Indiana much, and uh, so this is the first time in, in a, a while that I've been here, and I was on the phone with my wife, and she wasn't able to, to come with me, and she said, how's Indiana? And, and we live in Salt Lake City. And I said, it is cold here. It is colder than Utah. Like it's, Indiana was having a power move on me when I got here to be like, oh, you think it's cold in Utah, huh? And I, I also told my wife, and I was like, and they're obsessed with cul-de-sacs here. That's the other thing. <laughs> Never seen so many circles. Um, it's great to be here. Here's what I want to tell you. I'm a terrible preacher. I'm terrible. So if you want good preaching, come back next week. Uh, I like to tell stories, and I feel like I'm a good teacher. And so uh, I just want to share with you uh, some stuff this morning and talk to you. And I'll answer a few questions right out of the bat. You know, first of all, yes, my name is Trinity. I didn't change my name because I became a, a Christian. Uh, there were some old Italian spaghetti westerns, and the cowboy's name was Trinity. My dad saw those movies. Um, I was doing pronouns long before it was cool. <laughs> Calm down. Uh, so here, from sixth grade to my senior year in high school, I, I grew up in Italy, but from, from sixth, sixth grade to, to high school, senior year, we, I lived in a different state and went to a different school. And my... My senior year of high school, we moved to, of all places, Utah. Now, this might be lost on you. Don't worry. I'll get you there. My name's Trinity in Utah. I don't know if you know, there's just quite a few Mormons in Utah. Central hub. And Mormons don't believe in the theological concept of the Trinity. So basically, my name was, hi, I'm not Mormon, right? <laughs> no blending in, none. And so my senior year of high school, my parents got saved at, at a church plant that was there in Utah, got saved, they got baptized at a YMCA pool, and they forced me and my brothers and sisters to, to go to church, and I gave my life to God in my senior year of high school. And one of my teachers at my high school She's obviously Mormon. They're all Mormon. Uh, she would pull me aside and she would ask me questions like, tell me about your faith. What do you believe? And she would talk to me about her faith and what she believed. I know some of you are like, what? You could do that in public school? It's Utah, people. They can do whatever they want. And so she would do this. And, and I remember one time, well, several times, it wasn't one, it was multiple times, she would, she would say stuff to me. She was like, I've got a daughter that's your age. You should meet her. She goes to this other high school. You should meet my daughter. And I was thinking, this teacher's trying to pawn her daughter off on me. I'll bet you she's ugly. And I was like, woof. You know, that's those things. And then I went to this event where it was like all these high schools were coming together and her, my teacher was a chaperone and and she had her daughter there, and I saw her daughter, and I was like, jackpot. <laughs> so I was like, hey, my name's Joe, Joe Smith. <laughs> so her daughter and I started dating, and, and uh, I was the first person that her daughter had this relationship with where I wasn't part of the Mormon culture. This wasn't my life. And she said to me, she, was, she would ask questions like, well, you know, why aren't you Mormon? I was brand new. I'm like reading the Bible for the first time. I'm, I'm learning about God for the first time. And I, I would say, well, I don't believe I can become a God someday. And she's like, well, we don't believe that. No, I actually think you guys do. You might want to look into that. And so she would go and talk to her bishop and talk to her parents. And she'd come back and she goes, we do believe that. And I was like, I know, I, look, I don't have all the answers, but there's this church. Why don't you come with me on a Wednesday night? So she came on a Wednesday night 
And she will tell you this out of her, out of her own mouth. It was that Wednesday night service. And we've seen it, you know, the altar call and stuff like that. But the, the message and the story that Wednesday night that, that my girlfriend had heard was a message of love, grace, and hope. It was the first time she heard this message of love and hope and grace. And so she raised her hand and she gave her life to Jesus that night. Her mom hated me after that. (laughs) And then we got engaged in the middle of college and her mom really hated me. Like, you think you have problems with your in-laws? I'm just kidding, they're great when they're asleep. But... (laughs) So my wife grew up in Utah and and her great, great grandfather was like Brigham Young's best friend. Like when they settled Utah, they were like, you get this area, you know, like there's like statues to her family and stuff. And and I meet so many people in Utah that I realize like, oh, you're related to my wife. And I mean, they, they literally, I'm not kidding. I'm not, this isn't a joke. I can't even make it a joke. They did it. Uh, You know, like, like literally when you meet people that are related to my wife, what they ask each other is, well, what wife are you from? And it's like not a family tree, it's a family forest. It's, it's crazy. So listen, <laughs> guys, these jokes don't get any better. Like you better just, just laugh with me now because we've got some time. This message though of love and grace and hope, like a lot of times we think that it's just the message that we hear within the walls of the church and it's just presented from the stage that it's just this, this theological um, this, uh, expose that we kind of get in, in, in books or, or we get uh, you know, lectured to and we sit and we listen and that's the message and here's where it lives. But that's not true. This message is in each and every single one of us. It lives in all of us, this message message of hope and love and grace. And that message isn't just here, it's wherever you are, where all of us are. And you are not where you are on accident. None of us are. You're not at that school, you're not in that job, you're not in that neighborhood. You're not there on accident. You're there because God placed you. Like God's not shocked where you're at. Like God's not going, Trinity is a lawyer? (laughs) Whoa, didn't see that one coming. No, most of us, this is the majority of us, we have the jobs that we have because we have to. Some of us are lucky and we have the jobs that we have because we want to. But it doesn't matter if you have to or you want to, God has placed you where you are on purpose. Has placed you. And you know what? I'm doing the magic trick with the cards facing up. I'm gonna tell you how this sucker ends, okay? You are placed there because you are plan A. There is no plan B. And this message of hope and grace and love the way the world hears that message is us, where you've been placed. You are plan A for hope and grace and love. You are. So listen, I, I'm gonna tell you the story, uh, the this, this study that was done and I'll tell you how powerful hope and love are. Um, and I don't condone you know, the killing of animals, but this study that was done is they would take lab rats and they would put them in, in glasses of water and they would time to see how long, I mean, the, the, the rat is going to drown. It is going to drown in this water. There's no way out. But they would just time it to see how long, how long it would take for them to just give up and eventually drown. 15 minutes, that's what it was, 15 minutes. I mean, they'd do the study over and over and over. Rat would die after, lab rat would die after 15 minutes in this glass of water. But what they would start to do, and then they would take lab rats and they'd pull them out at 14 minutes. They'd pull them out, they would dry them off, they'd give them a little food to eat, they'd you know, pet them, give them some love, and would throw them back into the, the glass. See how long it's gonna take for them to just give up and die. Just give up and die. 
because the studies all showed 15 minutes, but when they were shown hope and they were shown love, 60 hours they would go. This is because within God's creation, it is ingrained in us to attach ourselves to hope and love. It's in our DNA in all of God's creation. It is powerful. And you, me, us, we, we're plan A. We're how that message gets out there. We bring it in every situation we find ourselves. Um, you, you heard that, that crazy long intro uh, that I listened to it and I'm like, that guy is boring. <laughs> like, I need to go do something fun. Um, but yes, I was assistant United States attorney for the Southern District of Florida, uh, based out of Miami, Florida, and um, I, I served in that position. And at the very end of it, they were having like a, the going away parties and when I was, was resigning from that position. And I was at this going away party and, and all these defense attorneys in town showed up to my going away. And one of my colleagues pulled me aside and they're like, we've never had defense attorneys show up when we're saying goodbye to the federal prosecutors like that. Like, you, they must, you must be like mean or something. And they're like, thank God he's leaving. You know, and... Uh, one of the defense attorneys scheduled a meeting with me and he was sitting down talking to me and he goes, you know what? I always knew there was something different about you. And everybody knew I was a Christian, not because I was like running around like street preaching or, you know, had a bumper sticker on my car that said Jesus or had a shirt that looked like the Sprite logo but said spirit, you know. They knew I was a Christian because I just shared my perspective from the biblical standpoint and just shared my life with them. And it was just natural. But this guy, he said to me, he said, Trinity, I knew there was something different about you, so I Googled you. And he, I, saw that, I saw that you're a pastor and you preach. I was like, eh. And he said, you know what? I just want you to know, I saw you preach your Jesus long before I ever saw you preach your Jesus. I was like, man, thanks. And then it was like the next day I was in federal court and I was in front of one of the federal judges that I had multiple trials in front of and, and she was right before the hearing and she's like, Mr. Jordan, I Googled you. <laughs> yes, your honor. And uh, she said, I, I hear you're leaving us. So I wanted to Google you and find out what you were doing next. Because these positions are, are very political positions uh, that I was resigning from. So usually, you know, people are working their way up the ladder somewhere to be a senator or something, um, be in the White House. And, and uh, I said, yes, Your Honor. And she said, I see that you're a pastor. I said, yes, Your Honor. And she said, well, I just want you to know that didn't shock us here because you were the most loving person I've ever seen in my courtroom. Um. Thanks, I, I'll, I'll tell you though, I was sad in all those moments. And I'll tell you why. Because it dawned on me I was doing this wrong. You're like, what? Like, look, that was just naturally me and how I'd been discipled as a follower of Jesus. And I'm, I'm happy about those things, but I'll tell you, here's what I missed. I was placed there on purpose. And I realized all my opportunities I had missed. So it wasn't a pat on the back for me. It was, oh, I missed it. I let this be natural, but I didn't do it on purpose. And had I done it on purpose, I wouldn't have missed some opportunities. You and I are placed on purpose. I was there. You are there. We are there to be the message on purpose. Let me, let me show you this. Luke chapter 12, I'm gonna walk you through it. And I think this is one of my favorite parables. It's kind of a, a gloss over parable that people don't usually spend a lot of time on. But let me start in verse 15 here. It says, and this is Jesus talking. He said, and he said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. 
For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. So what Jesus is talking about here, and we'll unpack a little bit more of this, he's saying all those things of the world, everything that the world has to offer, whether it's prestige, status, jobs, job titles, money, cars, houses, bank accounts, clothes, like all of those things that you and I spend so much of our time chasing after that we think it's gonna bring meaning to our life. He says, all of those things won't give you what you want. What he's saying here is life doesn't work that way. You think it does, but life doesn't work that way. And so then here it is in verse 16, he starts telling the parable. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all of my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So here's what happens. Jesus tells this parable, and in the parable, God has blessed this individual. And this individual decides, well, you know, here's what I'll do. I'm gonna just tear down everything I got, and I'm gonna build bigger stuff to put all the other blessing that God has given me, and I'm gonna put it in my new barns. And there's two, you know, what God says to him is he says, you're a fool, And there's two things here that he says you're a fool about. Uh, The first one is actually in the text there. And he says you're a fool because he says, I'm gonna kill you tonight. And when you die, whose is all this gonna be? Like, where's it going, right? You've probably been in church and you've heard maybe a pastor say, you know, there's no U-Hauls at at the funeral, right? We're not Egyptians, we're not taking this stuff with us, right? So that's the first way that God says he's a fool. Now, the second thing he says he's a fool about is he's, it's intrinsic within the text. And what he's saying he's a fool about is that God didn't give him and bless him and place him where he is so that all of that can terminate on himself. He's been given that for others. He's been blessed for others. He's been blessed for God. So there's, there's something more to unpack here in, in chapter 12. So look at this, verse 21. It's the same question. So is the one who lays up, uh, that's the, the theology according to Elmer Fudd. <laughs> so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. What does it mean to be rich towards God? Look at this, we jump 10 verses to 31. Instead, seek his kingdom and these things will be added to you. Seek his kingdom and everything that you've been searching for, everything you want, beauty, meaning, purpose, will be given to you. In fact, if you read all of Luke 12, you sit down, it'll take you a few minutes, it's it's nothing. Uh, nothing time to, to do. He talks about the idea of like the flowers being clothed and not worrying about clothing. And he talks about being fed and being taken care of. And he, and he uses a raven as the example. I mean, a raven is a rat with wings, right? We all, come on, admit it. It's, nobody goes bird watching for ravens. And Jesus is like, look, even God takes care of the rat with wings. He's gonna take care of you. Takes care of the lilies in the field. He's gonna take care of you. He's getting to this idea of we're, we're always searching for purpose and meaning and that we think somehow stuff and status and prestige or whatever it is is gonna fulfill us. And he says, no, 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 no. Seek his kingdom and then you'll be taken care of. You're gonna have all that meaning and beauty all of that, the abundance of life, seek his kingdom. Like going after God is more important 
than the things of this world. So, uh, I don't know if you know this, but anytime you see the vice president or the president of the United States out in, outside of Washington, D.C., and they have their, their motorcade, there's always an assistant United States attorney that's assigned to the motorcade. And so I've, I've been in the motorcades several times, and I, and I worked in the Obama administration and into the Trump administration. Super relaxed times in, in government, super relaxed. <laughs> Very easy. Um, and so I've been in those motorcades, and, and one, of, one, of, one of our presidents during those administrations had a couple houses down there in South Florida. Um, so those are a lot of motorcades. And uh, I, I think I already said this this weekend several times that, um, I don't know if I'm supposed to tell you, but I'm sure somebody will call me and tell me, ah, you can't say that if I, be like, well, it's online. Um, but usually it's like the third, the third car back from, from the limousine where the, the president is. It's called, that's called the beast. I don't know if you know that. That's what the limo's called that the president's in. And uh, so I've been in the motorcade. And, and why they have an assistant U.S. attorney assigned to the motorcade is because every federal arrest has to be approved by the U.S. attorney's office. And so Secret Service, FBI, whoever the law enforcement is, if something goes on during that time, they can detain individuals, but if there's an actual crime that's gonna be charged and there's gonna be an actual arrest, it has to go through the federal judicial system and, a, and an assistant U.S. attorney has to approve that arrest and approve what's going on in those situations. And so I was that individual in the motorcades and uh, you know, so usually that third car, you'd have Secret Service detail that's coordinating with the rest of the Secret Service detail, and then you'd have whoever is in charge of local law enforcement um, would be in that, in that vehicle, and then there would be me. And, you know, I, the very first time that I was ever in these motorcade, um, it was a fun time, because I, I don't know if you could tell, I like to tell jokes, I like to joke around, I like to, to have fun with the people that I'm, I'm around, and so I'm always joking around with the Secret Service you know, because that's yeah, such a boring job. They just stand around like nonstop, like literally so boring. And uh, so they just need a good joke every once in a while. And, you know, I'm, I'm saying, uh, hanging out with these guys and joking with them. And, and, uh, and they, they said, like, Trinity, uh, how does it feel to know that if anything goes down, we're all turning to you and you're in charge? I'm like, we are all doomed. <laughs> you know, and they'd be like, Trinity, are you willing to take a bullet for the president? No. <laughs> Did not sign up for that. <laughs> not in the job description. Mm -mm. But I mean, I remember when they asked me that question, how do you feel? And I'm thinking, this is the president of the United States. Like, this is pressure. Like, there was a time, I remember being in the motorcade where, you know, they jam all the radio signals and cell phones when the, when the motorcade's going. So if you've ever been around the motorcade and your cell phone's not working or something, like, yeah, they're jamming everything. But when that jamming device, I was in the motorcade once when it, the jamming device wasn't working and everybody's doing like 120 miles an hour uh, on clear interstates, which is, you're like, in Miami? Yeah, they cleared that. That's awesome. Um, but all of the vehicles fan out around the limousine to create a blast radius, you know, basically so everybody else dies and the limo is, is fine. It's awesome to be in that. But I'm just thinking during this time when it's going, I'm like, oh, here we go, here we go. Like something's gonna happen, something's gonna happen. The jamming device is, is not working and I'm like running through my head like, okay, I've gotta make a decision, split decision, would they ask me something? Like act like you know what you're doing. You've seen some movies, like just recite. <laughs> recite whatever you saw in that movie. You know, I'm just like going through my head and just the pressure I was feeling. But here's the thing I wanna say. You have the God of the universe that's sitting to, and saying to each and every single one of us, how do you feel that I've entrusted you with the most important message in the world for your family, for your job, for your neighborhood, for the people you encounter? How do you feel? 
that should feel weighty. That should feel like, oh my goodness. I have a responsibility. This isn't the president. This is the God of the universe. Because remember, you are plan A. And there is no plan B. You're plan A. You have been placed for a reason. But here, I, I gotta tell you this though. You've been placed for a reason, but you will be replaced in most of these areas. Don't forget what's most important when you are placed. This is the first time this weekend that I've ever shared this, but for 18 months, the last 18 months that I was an assistant US attorney, my marriage was falling apart. It was done. And my wife said, no more Miami. I'm moving back to Utah. And so my wife and my kids were in Utah. And for 18 months, I flew back and forth between Salt Lake City and Miami every weekend. 6.30 p.m. flight from Fort Lauderdale. I would take it to get home to Salt Lake City. I'd get there almost 10 o'clock at night. I'd be there for the weekend. Sunday night, I would take a red eye that would leave at almost midnight, get me to Miami International Airport, close to 5 a.m. I would Uber to our condo that we had. I would take a shower, drink like five cups of coffee. And I would go to the office and I would work my guts out Monday through Friday and I would do it again. And I did it for 18 months. 18 months. My marriage didn't exist. And I was sitting in the US attorney's, in his office, I was waiting to go into a meeting with him and I was just sitting waiting in the kind of the, the exterior office, like his little lobby that he had. And I was, I was looking up on the wall and there was the pictures of all the former US attorneys. Cause see, the US attorney is appointed by the President of the United States and they're confirmed by the Senate. Assistant US attorneys are hired by the US attorney and appointed by the Attorney General. And I was sitting there and I was looking at all the, the photos and I was looking at the ones that I had worked under and just thinking to myself, oh, when this guy's done, we're just gonna put his photo right there after and there's gonna be another person that's gonna move right back in, into that office. And we're just gonna keep, this thing's gonna just keep going. It's gonna keep trucking. And when I'm done, somebody else is gonna take my office. I forgot where I was placed. God had placed me in my family. And I was neglecting my family for something that I was gonna get replaced in. And I went home and I was there that weekend and I remember talking to my, she was my oldest daughter and she was in junior high at the time and, and I said to her, I, I said, uh, hey Madison, what do you think if, you know, I like, I don't know, come back to Utah and I'm just a normal attorney, I'm not no fancy government attorney and I'm just, uh, I could take you and drive you to school every, every day. And she just started crying. And I was like, yeah. Because see, at the end of my life, she's gonna be there next to my bedside and all these people I'm working with and everybody in that motorcade. And nobody's gonna be next to my side at the end. But she is. And God has placed me to be her father. And he's placed me to be this husband. Placed me to be in this family. Nick Saban was the, the greatest college coach that we'd seen. He was replaced in 72 hours. Somebody moved into his office. Somebody's new photo went up. Somebody else had that job. He's been replaced. Verse 33 of chapter 12. Jesus says, sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. He's not just talking about money. He's saying, what have you linked your heart to? What have you linked yourself to in this world? Because you should link it to the kingdom of God. You should link it to this message, this message of hope, 
grace and love. Now, it's unbelievably key, these verses here, uh, 33 and 34, because Jesus isn't saying like, listen, if you got great wealth, ah, eek. No, 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 because there's parts of the Old Testament where actually God's people are commanded to have great wealth and they're commanded to build big barns. But what he's saying here is your heart should be linked to the things of God, not the things of this world. What, so what it means to be rich towards God is to live in a way that you pursue God and you realize you are plan A and everything that you've been blessed with, your talents, your skills, your job, you've been blessed with all of this so that you can push back what is dark in this world so that you can complete plan A. Listen, there are 2,103 verses in our sacred literature where God talks about what it is to live this out. And the Bible talks about what it means to help the poor, the oppressed, the foreigner, the widow, the orphan. 2,103 verses. Because you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Listen, I'm an attorney. I deal with people's problems all day long. Corporations' problems. Nobody nobody comes to an attorney because good things are happening. (laughs) They don't get calls that are like, we're getting married. (laughs) We're having a baby. I don't get to celebrate in people's the good things. They call me when stuff hits the fan. You could decide what it is. But I am there on purpose. And so every morning now, I'm not just being a disciple of Christ, I'm being a disciple of Christ on purpose. And so when I drive to my office every morning, I pray, God, my encounters today, the conversations I'm gonna have, the people I'm gonna be with, the judges I'm gonna appear in front of, the clients I'm gonna meet with, the CEOs I'm going to be working with. God, whoever it is, I'm having those conversations because you have placed them in my life. God, let me see what I need to see. Let me hear what I need to hear. And let me go into every single one of those meetings on purpose. Yeah, I'm completing a job, but I know my assignment. I'm there on purpose. One of my great friends, a former FBI agent, and I talk to him literally every week. He's he's a retired FBI agent. He was actually embedded at Ruby Ridge. He was undercover at Ruby Ridge. Some of you are like, Ruby, what? Google it. And uh, I talked to him every week, and, and I mean, he looks like he came out of central casting, and they were like, Ruby Ridge, you know, like, go. He, he looks militia, Idaho militia, uh, 100%. And uh, he tells me the stories about being undercover there and doing his job and living the life but being undercover. I mean, like, that's what it is for you and I in this world. We're just undercover. We are placed here by God but we got a purpose. We are placed here to do a job, even though we've got a job. We got another job. And we need to remember that. There's 2,103 verses that say what it means to follow God, to live this message out, what it looks like to have God's heart what it looks like to be plan A here in this world. It's open-handed living where you and I work for, give for, use our influence for plan A. Hope, grace, and love. Listen, later on, Jesus will say stuff like this. He'll say, don't be like the Gentiles. The Gentiles use power and influence to lord over others. You're not gonna be like that. You're gonna use all that we've given you, all that God has blessed you for God, 
for others. And so when we work, when we're in our jobs, we should reflect God. And you need to know this, that you have been gifted and you have been given by God to push back what's dark in this world. And I know it's cool right now, like the cool thing to do as a Christian is, is to like criticize the world, criticize all the junk that's going on. And there's a lot of junk. But guys, the dark is dark on purpose. We're criticizing the dark for being dark. Duh. It's dark. Be the light. Don't be shocked that the dark is dark. It's not of God. It shouldn't be reflecting anything like God. You reflect God. You be the light. You be the salt. And realize that your jobs, the stuff that you've been blessed with, that wasn't given to us so that it might terminate on ourselves. It was given to us to be plan A. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for just this reminder. The pep talk that we all need, that we have been sent with a purpose, that we are plan A, that you have placed us in our jobs, in our work, in our schools, in our communities, in our families for a purpose. Remind us of that purpose. Let us live that love and hope and grace out. God, help us to give this message to the world around us that so desperately needs to see the light, that so desperately needs salt. I pray that as all of us go forth after hearing this message, after seeing this message, God, our interactions would come with a different mission. And that's knowing that we have the greatest message in the world instilled upon us to carry. I pray that you would bless all of us in this mission, in this plan. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, amen. Thank you.